Hello. Hi. Hello. How's it going? Hi, sorry, I didn't hear you. Um. Oh yeah, yeah. How's it going? Going good. How are you? Good. Thank you. How are you? I'm good. I'm just pulling up my. This is Amcast, not. <laughs> sorry, if so many of the AMC tabs open, I can't even find. What um subject do you want to do today? Uh, what would you like to do? Um, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe bio bio chem. Uh, yeah, we can do that. Ugh. All right. Let's uh yeah, let's see if you could zoom out a little bit. Maybe like one or two more times. I don't think I can zoom out more. Uh you can just hold down like the command or option button and, and hit the minus sign. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I yeah, I guess that's that's fine. Let's see if you could do it one more time, I just want to see what it looks like. All right, that might include everything on the left. Yep. Cool. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Can you do this on test day? Um I don't remember doing it on test day, so maybe not, but that was a long time ago. So yeah, I'm not sure, but I, but I do remember on test day, it was pretty like low res. So it looked like it was really like zoomed in and stuff. Okay. Um. All right. So let me start reading. Yeah. Uh, the human intestinal tract is, inhib is inhabited by a diverse... Didn't we do this? We did something like this, yeah. But I don't think it was this exact one. Correct. Okay. Microorganisms known as bi microbiota. These microbial populations are increasingly implicated in the regulation of host metabolism and the development of obesity and diabetes. Okay, so there's a positive correlation between microbial populations and uh, obesity and diabetes, like if we were to write it out. Uh, we don't know that yet, right? Increasingly implicated. So they're, that's what like they're assuming is, but we don't know yet. So they're involved. And usually the first paragraph or the these types of passages don't really tell you much in the beginning besides like regulation, right? Because they're saying that it's um, implicated in the regulation of host metabolism. Okay. Um, the catabolism of dietary fiber by gut microbiota results in the production of short-term short-chain fatty acids such as butyrate and acetate, which are important energy sources for the host. Okay, so now we could write something. So catabolism um, and energy sources. Uh-huh. What about, um, what, what are some other stuff? <sighs> Dietary fiber gets cat catabolized by the gut microbiota, which produces the short-term fatty acids, 
which are energy sources for the host. So it's kind of like what we did in that other passage that we did that was similar. Like I, I just wrote this like kind of like fiber turns into the short chain fatty acids through the action of gut microbiota. Mm hmm Okay. All right. Um, C uh, CFAs are also act as a signaling molecules, which with the ability to bind and activate G protein coupled receptors. Mm -hmm. Um bind G protein <laughs> receptors. Yep, so I just turned the SCFA into like a circle and I drew this other cell with a with a receptor like that. Mm -hmm. So oh and then that would be a GPCR. What are you thinking? GPCR, but it's not. Okay, can we say like activation? Activate like activation of what? Well, they're saying that like they have the ability to bind with and activate the G protein. Yeah. Okay. All right. So the GPCR and GPCR43 is expressed in white adipose tissue and is not expressed in muscle or in liver. Researchers generated GPCR43 deficient mice to analyze the contribution of it to energy regulation. Mm -hmm. um, so that we can say um, what? G yeah. Mm -hmm. Wild type and GPCR43 deficient mice were fed a standard diet or high fat diet and their body weight in grams was measured weekly for 16 weeks. Okay. Um high fat diet for the GPCR um deficient mice was <laughs> like the highest all throughout yeah so this <laughs> bless you. so this figure um has like two different uh conditions <laughs> bless you so it has two different conditions so you know, there's the wild type, there's a mutant, and then there's standard diet, high fat diet. Mm -hmm. So if you want to compare these, like, let's say we want to compare mutant to uh, wild type, mm -hmm. we would keep like the diet same, right? Right. So compared, so uh, wild type compared to mutant, which has a greater body weight. So the mutant has the higher one. Good. And high fat diet versus standard diet, which is higher? High fat. Okay. Good. Uh, okay, uh, continue. Next, researchers examine the relationship between GPCR43 function and insulin sensitivity. Adipocytes from WT and GPCR43, well, the, whatever, the deficient lot were in, incubated in the presence and absence of both insulin and acetate, and uptake of radioactive glucose was measured. Mm hmm um, so now you want to read the caption for figure two? Yeah, I just I want to make sure that I understand it, right? So I'm just rereading it quickly. Sometimes when I'm like reading it a lot, I don't process it as well as if I was just like to myself. 
Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, okay, so we're testing like insulin and sensitivity, uptake of glucose. Okay, so insulin and acetate levels mm. for each of them. And then we had wild type. Why do they repeat twice? Which one? Like, um, radioactive glucose uptake, but mm -hmm. if you look over here, they have both like the wild type and um, the mutated one, they have it twice. Oh, yeah, because you know, there's the case with no insulin and ask and no acetate, there's a case with no insulin but with acetate there's a case with no acetate but insulin and there's a case where there is both insulin and acetate okay i understand all right so yeah read the caption Uptake of radioactive glucose and wild type and mutated adipocytes in the presence and absence of both insulin and acetate. That's what. And then that note. Remember when we talked about PVAP? Yeah, that, that was like the anything. I thought it was anything like, yeah, less than uh, 0.05 was like, like important. Yeah, statistically significant. Statistically significant, yeah. Yep. So, okay, now as we analyze this figure, um, I think the best way is just to kind of like, well, okay, two things. If you're like, um, well, maybe three things. So like on the test, I talked to you about how like, you know, 15 seconds kind of thing. Yeah. So. Like, wait, what 15 second thing? Oh yeah. Like how long to be looking at the graph the first time? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, if you have a little bit more than that time, time wise, but you still don't have the full amount of time, then I would just look at what's statistically significant. Mm -hmm. So this one. But as we do it together, we're gonna do it kind of like slowly and systematically from like I would say the leftmost graph I mean sorry leftmost bar mm -hmm. so in the leftmost bar we see that they're pretty much the same um like wait. insulin and uh, like not having insulin or acetate for the wild type and having no insulin but having acetate doesn't really change it that much it's like still around 12 Yep. So, so wild type acetate does not seem to have an effect on the amount of glucose uptake, which, so what is that amount of glucose? So like the amount of glucose update, uh, uh, uptake, what is that, um, a measure of here? Well, we're testing for insulin sensitivity. And insulin and glucose are like directly correlated with each other. So it's like as a result, we're learning about the insulin sensitivity. And when, you say, when you say about uh, insulin uh, and glucose, you said what? Well, like glucose, like, um, like when the body. Like the body produces insulin in response to like glucose levels, mm -hmm. or like stops to produce glucose uh, insulin. Okay. So glucose uptake would have like a certain effect on like the insulin level. Okay. So I was just saying that they're correlated. Yep. Yep. You're you're absolutely right. So okay, let's move on to that the next pair of mutants ones it seems like it's exactly the same right yeah all right and then the next 
one so of here there is like a significant difference where like if insulin is present but wild type isn't then it's much higher and then acetate kind of like regulates it and brings it down to this like 12 level but it's still like a little bit higher than the other ones so so wait you said like when insulin is present but acetate isn't that's like the highest one but when they're both present it almost like acetate regulates it and what do you say regulate like comparing the two like the presence of acetate brings the glucose uptake back down to like almost a normal level sure compared. so we can write something about that right like we could yeah. say that like acetate is negatively correlated with glucose uptake in the wild type when insulin's present yep so we could say that insulin in parentheses, wild type is proportional to what would it be proportional to? Like glucose uptake, rise in glucose uptake. <laughs> okay, now in that in that other bar that has both insulin and acetate, it seems like. What does it seem like? Like acetate is negatively correlated. Yeah. What, what um so you could add like one over acetate over here. So so like in the presence of insulin, I think that that's an important thing to mention that it's like when it's on its own obviously it doesn't have the same effect but the uh, in the presence of insulin um uh, acetate is negatively correlated with glucose uptake got it excellent yeah yeah because it's not just that acetate is inversely proportional to glucose uptake because of exactly what you said but it could be inversely proportional to insulin sensitivity right mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay. And then the last set of bars. Um, the last set of bars. Mm -hmm. It's like absence of insulin. Okay, so now it's the mutated one. And here they're both raised. So here we can still keep like insulin is um uh, positively correlated with uh, glucose uptake, but we can't say this part where acetate is um, uh, inversely proportional to insulin sensitivity. Good. So, okay. Let's try some of uh... These questions. Um, Which table shows the expected body weight? I'll type in mutated mice have fed a high fat diet while housed for 16 weeks. Okay, so this is more based off of this one where we said that. Mutated was higher than wild type. So that crosses out. Wait, I don't want to cross anything out yet, actually. Mutated is higher than wild type and high fat diet is higher than standard diet. Um, conventional or germ-free condition. What in germ-free condition mean like a lack of... um. the like it would be the mutated the ones that were deficient right because germ-free condition where the gut does not become colonized then that means it's lacking the microorganisms which microorganisms we said the body weight would be higher with on a high fat diet um 
So, okay, here's here's where I'm going with this. Um, I think overall, wait, where did the? Oh, I hit it. I I hit it. Oh. <laughs> so, let's think about this for for a sec. So, how how would you be able to mm, describe to me what happens in this passage, like from let's say the drawings that we made? So we were testing the significance of certain factors like in relation to like gut microbiome and like their effects on certain things. So the first experiment was testing like uh, mutated and um, wild type mice. Before that, sorry, before that first experiment, what did we talk about? Or like think about what we drew first. we draw first we said that like the fiber okay what about it what gim means oh that's just my bad handwriting it's gm so it's glucose uh something else see the thing is is that like i don't remember the like the way that they uh so what abbreviate words what is passage? So what uh would be the thing that turns fiber into short chain fatty acids? Oh, but it was the I thought that it was talking about glucose molecules there, wasn't it? Um well something is causing the fiber to be turned into SDFAs. Yes. And it sh it glucose shouldn't be the like glucose doesn't really cause it that type of like a chemical reaction like that right? Okay. So. So okay, I'll 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 kind of give you a hint here. So in the question stem, they mentioned germ free. So gut microbiome. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Yes. Good. Yeah, I was like stuck on this like glucose molecule thing, and so I was like, I don't know what else it could be. Like that's the that's a recency effect, right? All right. The last part that you read was about glucose. Mm -hmm. But okay, gut microbiota converts fiber into short chain fatty acids. Uh, now what? What what's the next thing I drew? The uh, Watt and the GPCR forty three, which was um in uh white adipose tissue, uh huh, but absent in muscle and the other stuff. They said, "All right, good. You you got that detail down. So okay, so 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 SCFAs are supposed to bind to the GPCR forty three, right? Yes." And so, okay, now if we make a mutant that does not have the GPCR43, apparent, like, what results do we see? If it doesn't have the GPCR43, then it's the um, mutated ones, we said. And so now we're looking at the table and it was saying that like they did two experiments where they had mutated versus wild type and they were looking at high fat diets versus standard diets. And so those are the results. I don't know if you can you see when I like how my or OK, so the body weight was higher for mutated versus wild type and also like within that category, high fat diets had a higher body weight than standard diets. So, okay, so the mutant has a higher body weight than a wild type. What, tell me about the mutant. Like, what do they do? Well, the it's the absence of. Oh, crap. Oh, double crap. Okay. Tell me what you're saying. It's the absence of the GPCR43 because, so it can't bind to the, um, a short chain fatty acid good so 
So by SCFA is binding to the GPCR43 as it does in wild type should produce a lower or higher body weight. Lower. If uh, it's binding to the GPCR43, then that's a wild type mouse. Yep, yep. Good. So, so okay. Now this question here is asking us what? Question is asking like um the expected body weights of the wild type versus the mutated mice when fed the high fat diet. And but then they're saying like the condition thing is like a conventional condition or germ-free condition where the gut does not become uh, colonized. Okay. So gut colonization would be attributed with having the GPCR43. So conventional oh. diet. Wait. Mm -hmm. Would a conventional diet introduce GPCR43 to the mutated mice? So then they're becoming wild type mice? Uh, yeah, no, because in, so, so. Because we never really knew that they were mutated. They just like didn't have it. Oh, we know that they're mutated. Anytime you see something like this, like minus minus, right? If we look back at this. But yeah. researchers, oh, generated. I, I didn't see that part. Yeah. So. So let's think about what you said about conventional versus, well, okay. So this question stem is asking about wild type and mutant and body weight of them and the variables or, you know, independent variables here are like conventional condition, let's say. Mm -hmm. and germ-free conditions so it's easier to understand what conventional condition means if we look at the 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 other type which is germ-free yeah so conventional has germs but right. then the part where it says where the gut becomes colonized not becomes colonized well in a conventional it would become colonized yep yep so so okay, this type of drawing that I did here, I call it like a like a schematic. And what drawing? Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And the purpose of it is to see things that. So the fiber. Mm -hmm. So in the presence of the um, gut microbiome. Uh, the fiber turns into short term, uh, short chain fatty acids, which interacts with the GPCR forty three. So then, none of this could happen if there's no gut microbiome. So yeah, uh, you're you're yeah. So basically, germ free condition does not okay. So like we know, so if we have the GPCR forty three deficient mutants, we know that we're crossing, we're eliminating the GPCR forty three at the like kind of end of this pathway. But if we created a germ-free condition where eliminating this like kind of like upstream, right? Mm -hmm. Pathway. So what did we determine is like something that would result in um, a higher uh, sorry, what would result in a lower body weight? And you said it was SCFAs binding to, to GPCR43, right? Mm -hmm. So, okay. So if we had the mutant and we have the conventional and germ-free condition, how would that affect the body weight of the mute. Of a mutant? Mm 
Or maybe okay. Let maybe let's start with. Am I crazy to say that it wouldn't affect it? Because if there's if they're not interacting with the short chain fatty acids, anyways, what would the difference be if it has or doesn't have it? Very good, very good. All right, what about wild type? Wild type in the absence wouldn't be able to produce the GPCR forty three. Wait, what? What was that? The oh. The wild type also wouldn't be able to produce the short chain fatty acids and they wouldn't interact with GPCR43. So there would also be like. You're saying in the germ free condition? Yeah. Okay. So what type of body weight should we see for wild type conventional compared to germ free? I think conventional would have a lower body weight than germ free. Exactly. So we're looking for what two things? So we're looking for. Um, I need to write this down. Uh -huh. Okay, so conventional, conventional is lower. Um, germ free is higher in uh wild type, and then in mutated, mutated mice are still heavier than wild type mice. Probably. And for mutated mice, no change in weight. Very good. So those are the conditions we're looking for. Yep. So, yeah, I blocked these because, you know, I wanted you to, like, be able to just purely think. And also because the question choices are like data interpretation themselves as well, which could be a lot uh, overwhelming at first. Okay. Um, so. Mm -hmm. A is wrong because yep. wild type is heavier than mutated. I need my strike there. I don't think they'll, they'll let you do it for that. Because it's like an image. Isn't there a way to like hide it? Oh my god. What, what is happening? Isn't there a way to hide it? Uh, No, but I can hide it for you. No, it's fine. I just know that it's wrong. And then convert conventional is lower than germ free, which we said. And then, but how do we know what the original weight was? Oh, it doesn't really matter. It was in the fifties. Go go back to what you're you were you were thinking before. Like, so for okay. regardless, so and then the mutated should be higher than wild type, which is true ish. This is the issue though 58 is higher than these two, so I'm not looking at that one. Conventional is higher than so this one's wrong. This one, so what are we? Um, but wait, different. we said that conventional and like for the mutated, there shouldn't be a change. Good, yeah, that's oh, those are pretty separate. So then, is this one better because it could be close, but then like looking at these three values, they're like the closest together. Yep, so yeah, so first you were looking, first you were looking at okay, is the G is the mutant heavier? Then the wild type, and that makes sense. But before we, before I let you see like the choices, you were you were telling me that we're looking for, in wild type, a germ free condition producing a higher body weight, in the mutant. Isn't much of a change between germ free and conventional, because it doesn't have that receptor. Which means that the weights would be pretty similar. Okay. So. 
So I think like I actually it was really stressful when we were doing it, but I understand why you like crossed out the answer choices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I want to give you the opportunity to think because that's every like this entire test is about think it's critical thinking. Um, that's the most important important thing. And, and what I try to teach my students is like tolerance of uncertainty, mm -hmm. like. you don't know the answer like it's okay that's kind of like you know uh where you start learning Sounds good. Okay. Um Yep. Yeah. Acids. Like this. They all they'll, they'll always ask something like this. Is this when we were talking about the STP? STY? STY, yeah. Well, that's different, right? That's related to what? That's what I thought, that that was something else that we were talking about. That was, um, I don't remember what it was. I just remember you said, like, if you see something about this, like, it can only be so so uh so yeah what i'm about to say write it down because you absolutely have this is super high yield you absolutely have to know this but okay. kinase is kinase that was that's what it was yep so kinases are what enzyme Okay. So 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 what enzyme class for kinases? Oh, like what classification was? It was phosphorylase. Uh nope, it's a transferase. Which means it can transfer functional groups most of the time. that functional group that it transfers will be a phosphate. Wasn't phosphate like have a different group though? When you say a different group? Like wasn't there phosphorylase or am I making it up? Well, th there's phosphorylases, there's phosphatases, there's hydrolases, there's lyases, there's ligases. But then the general groups you're saying. Oh yeah, those are the general groups. There's also oxidoreductase, right? But basically, kinases. Lost the like zoom thing in the like white. Okay, yeah. sorry. Yeah. So, so kinases are involved, are transferases, and make sure also that you know those enzyme classes. Do you remember that like chart I sent you before? Yeah, yeah I have it. Yeah, make sure you have those down, okay? So kinases, and this is super, super high yield, so definitely make sure you have this down. Kinases are transferases. They're involved in the transfer of phosphate groups. ATP. And they, yeah, and it's, because uh, I think you're usually saying STP, like that's kind of like standard temperature and pressure, but um, it'll be STY. Yeah. And um, it automatically wants to. What are those all have in common? They're all um, polar, right? Well, there's a lot of polar stuff. What makes STY so? The um, OH. Yeah. And when you see an OH group, what do you want to, what, what do I say to, to think? That it could like bond to something else. Yep. So it's, it's the most common. Mm -hmm. What? Sorry. Oh, the hydroxyl group is the most common, like functional group. Oh no, it's the most common. Uh, start with an N. Okay. 
It ends with file. Nuclear file. Oh, I remember we were talking about that nuclear file kindness. You said that. Yes. So a nuclear file is the Lewis base. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh and yeah, you're gonna hundred and trillion percent going to see this stuff on your test. So yeah, this I know. Electrophile and Lewis acid. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Now for this one. Transmembrane domains of transmembrane. Doesn't it have to do with like polarity? Like which part's hydrophilic, which part's hydrophobic? Okay, tell me which parts are are which. So um the hydrophilic is usually like found inside of like inside. Well when a protein um now I'm like trying to picture it. Like when a protein folds, like the hydrophilic part is inside and then the hydrophobic. Wait, opposite. Protein folding. Hydrophobic is outside. Hydrophilic is inside. No, I keep flipping. <laughs> hydrophilic is outside. Hydrophobic is inside. So because the water. Yeah. So that's protein folding. Okay. Yes. Or like globular proteins that are not, you know, integrated into like a membrane. Mm-hmm. But what do they mean by like, you know, what amino acid is least likely to be found in the transmembrane domains? Because like this is also something that they'll trillion percent, you know, ask you. So tell me a little bit more about what you're what you're thinking. I just don't know, like transmembrane domain like don't you have to like find some quality that that has yep what quality would it have transmembrane means it's like going through a membrane like from one side to the other Okay. So within, like, I think the outsides. So if you're looking at a um mem a yep. member, you have the like hydrophilic heads and the hydrophobic tails. So the inside would be hydrophobic. Yep. Yeah. So the, the one that's like going to be the answer is the one that's hydrophilic. Mm hmm. Because that's least likely to be inside. Hydrophilic would be charged. Mm hmm. Which ones are charged? Yeah. Aspartic acid. Yep. Yeah, this is a very common type of question that they'll ask you. Okay. Just had to like think it through for a second. Like which, like what would be a quite a characteristic of the transmembrane like domain? Yep, yep. Transmembrane yep. means it like goes through the membrane. So then inside of the membrane, what are the qualities that it has? Yep, yep. Okay. Compared to wild type, which experimental group is most likely to remain lean when fed, high fed? GPCR43 antagonist would mean that it like wouldn't work as well as it does. So that's kind of on par with the mutated ones. Good. Um, overexpressed potentially. Yeah. Um, treated with drugs that inhibits the generation of intracellular and antibiotics. I don't know what effect that they would have. Like it's not listed in the experiment. What do you think? I think antibiotics would kill bacteria. All right. How would that be re related to what this past? You said that um, as far as bacteria goes, that's kind of on par with that other question where they're like um, germ-free. Yep. And so that was like a higher weight. That so was, yeah. I think maybe A is wrong. Yeah, right. Because that's the equivalent of 
this, right? Getting rid of the gut microbiota. So if it's generation of intracellular second messengers, I think that C is the best answer. All right. Tell me a little bit more about B though. I mean, G CR43 is overexpressed. So we know that when GPCR43 is present, I mean, uh, that, that like is associated with a lower weight. So if it's overexpressed. Oh, you want to hear about D? <laughs> Inhibits generation of intracellular second messengers. It would inhibit the short chain fatty acids, right? That's what the sec intracellular second messenger would be. And that means that like if there's no GPCR43, then that's again associated with the mutated. Yeah, so it's like if the SCFAs bind to the GPCR43, it should produce these second messengers, right? Mm -hmm. So this is the same thing, except we're looking more downfield or downstream or whatever. Okay. That's the purpose of this type of drawing. So, yep. Good job. Inclusion about glucose uptake is best supported by the data in figure two. We saw this in Oh yeah. It was negatively in wild type. But we couldn't say the same. So this one's true. But not in C in the mutated one, it didn't have an effect. Yeah. So for now. Stimulates insulin mediated glucose uptake independently. I feel like acetate was like always the, like, I don't know, insulin was more important for the assumption. So I didn't, I'm going to look at C and D. It stimulates glucose uptake. Yes. But it also does that in um the mutated so this one well this one's just wrong uptake in the presence of acetate insulin does not suppress glucose uptake mm -hmm. and then i don't like that it says but not in gpcr for like in the mutated ones because it does still stimulate mm -hmm. So A is the best one. What about B? Insulin-mediated glucose uptake, it doesn't stimulate. That's the issue. Okay. Independently, uptake independently of HGs. So then they want us to look at uh, the mutated ones, and there's no... Yeah, I, I don't know. I like A better. Yeah, yeah, because if acetate did that independently of GPCR43 expression, right, we should see the same values in the wild type of the mutant when okay. you have acetate and insulin. All right. Right. If anything, it would be like suppresses, which I guess is what A is, yeah. All right, cool. So yeah, here's another one. So yeah, these can be pretty overwhelming. Like a question, like we already have data to interpret. Well, hold on, because we know that muscle, like what isn't present in muscle. Sure, sure, sure. There, there's no wild type. Um, there's no. So this isn't expressed in muscle or liver so that means that it would most likely have um higher like be associated with like a higher fat mutated diet or not necessarily but it would be like a mutation do you uh, read the, the question yet i haven't read it no but i just i have a feeling that that's going to be part of it yeah 
insulin signaling results in the phosphorylation of the downstream target, AKT, which can be quantified by Western blot analysis. So I know that there's like a thing with um, Western blot, like the like what it does, like like there's Northern, Southern, Western blotting, and then they each have their own um, thing that they measure for. Yep. Do you remember which ones? Mm, I'm not sure. Okay. So, yeah, continue. I don't know if that's like an important detail. Probably. Um, yeah, you could still do it. Okay. Um, all right, insulin. Which graph shows the effect acetate administration will likely have on AKT phosphorylations in in what and muscles of wild type mice? Insulin signaling was proportional to glucose uptake, and there was higher glucose uptake in wild type without acetate and the same for both for the mutated ones but it's specifically for wild type yeah, so you can write insulin and in wild type is proportional to phosphorylated akt right. okay so Looking at this, the highest one should be insulin no acetate. So that's already getting rid of A in my mind and C. Okay. Without looking at any other factors. Mm -hmm. um, then... AKT phosphorylation is associated with the. Uh, sorry, which ones did you eliminate again? A and C. Okay. Now. Uh, what were you saying before about the muscle? The muscle doesn't have the GPCR, so it's essentially mutated. So, so the results would be closer to these. Yeah, or, or close to one another, right? Because right. Then I'm thinking B is the best one. Yep, because we also have compared to C, right, in the lot, we have... You know, if, if there's white adipose tissue, that means that there's essentially, or in wild type mice, that there's essentially the GPCR43. And we know that when that's the case, we should see a high value for insulin, just like you said here, and a lower value for insulin and acetate. And we see that here. And then here, we don't have any difference. So, good job. Okay. Compared to wild type mice, antibiotic treatment of wild type. Compared to untreated antibiotic, what was I saying about antibiotics? How? That would get rid of the bacteria, so that would increase body weight. So then B is wrong. Yeah. Um, insulin sensitivity was proportionate to um glucose uptake. So.
I don't think this is necessarily true. Because okay. looking at them, the ones that didn't have um like the 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 ones that were mutated still had really high levels of glucose uptake. And we know that they're related. So um I'm crossing out D for now. Increase plasma butyrate and increase volume of adipocytes. Increased volume of adipocytes would be associated with like a high fat diet, right? Like the more you eat, the more the volume increases. So, I mean, that's true. Okay. Plasma butyrate, that was associated with the short term chain fatty acids. There's no short chain fatty acids if you don't have the um, gut microbiota. So, I'm crossing A out. So, I think C is the answer. Good, good, good. Good job. Oh, we were talking about branching. You said leucine has it. I um, I think it was iso leucine. Were we looking at both of them, and you were drawing out like how leucine has like the V, but then iso leucine has the three. So then iso leucine had it. Oh, so leucine doesn't. No, no, no. My bad. Um, iso leucine is the one with the beta branch. And this is alkyl side chain. Oh, when I say beta branch, I mean like, you know, if this is the C terminal, and then this could be the R group, and then this could be like the amine. Mm -hmm. And so going outwards, like it would be like, I think this one will be alpha. I think this one would be beta. And then gamma would be next. There was one example where you showed it. Yeah, let me let me make sure over here. So okay, so something like this, let's say. So okay, it's not considering that carbonyl carbon, it's just after it. So that's alpha, that's beta, that's gamma. Okay. And so leucine would look like something like, whoops. That's not a W, sorry. That's just the amine, but then it would be like that. So you see the branch is there, but but anyway, this is just asking for what's unbranched. So what 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 do you think it would be? I don't know. I'm just like still. Yeah. I feel like the beta branching versus, so that wouldn't be the primary branched. I just, what do you mean by unbranched alkyl side chain? Like it's still the R group, right? Yep. It'll still have an R group, but what R group would not be unbranched, uh, sorry, would not be branched. So, so I think you told me you remember what these structures look like, right? Yeah, well, okay. For example, alanine has CH2, right? C uh, CH, like a methyl group, CH3. Sure. I'm thinking of them like as if it was a carboxyl over here. So CH2, CH3, which that is branch. So it has the three hydrogens. Well, uh, the branching is referring to the carbon. Well, there's only one carbon. Correct. That all the other ones have more than one carbon. So is that just the answer? Yep. Alanine comes up a lot in passages when they do like a mutation. Like let's say that they say like these residues are at the active site. 
and they want to figure out which residues are important. So they can just, uh, you'll see a lot, a lot of times that they will just mute, create a mutant that express that replaces one of the amino acids at the active site with alanine. And that would affect, you know, like the kinetics of it. But yep, alanine is just that methyl group. Okay. Yep, you can see right here. Right. Yeah. But look at these other ones. See how this is branched? Yeah. This, oops, this is branched. That's branched. That's branch. Right. And so, oh, and then also like this is the alpha here. This is the alpha. Um I've never seen proline drawn out like that. Like what? Like, uh, like the I don't know. I've always just seen it drawn like a house. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a, um, I don't remember if it's an indole ring or not, but histidine is is very, oh crap, you know, proline, not histidine. Oh, okay, yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, proline, so proline is the only uh, amino acid. It's like it connects back. Exactly, it, uh, the, it has a secondary amine. Yeah. Yep. And um, but uh, histidine could be a little weird sometimes, but uh, but but yeah, you can see how, like for instance, aspartic acid. If you replace this acid with an amide, you get asparaginine. If you replace this peroxylic acid in the R group with glutamate, you get glutamine. And this is called this because. Asparagus has a lot of asparaginine in it. So I figured it was something related. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. Stereochemical designators for alpha and beta distinguish between. Um, I can't remember the difference between enantiomers and epimers. Okay. Do you remember what? Oh, so yeah, another thing you should be able to do is to draw, like, the straight chain version of, like, glucose. Like C six H twelve O six, yeah. But like the, what is it called? A Fisher projection, I think. Uh -huh. That's like when it's like on this side and this side. Mm hmm. So what helps you remember is like the middle finger. We have O H here, 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 here. So that would look like. Yeah, that it's on opposite sides every time. Can you say every time? Oh. What what's what's so up here there's an aldehyde, right? And here it's uh CH two O H. Right. Mm -hmm. And if we were to number these one, two, three, four. Five, six. All right. All right. Uh, does this make sense what I just drew? Yeah, I've seen Fisher projections before. Yeah, so this is the one for glucose, okay? Now, whether it's called D glucose or L glucose will depend on the fifth carbon's orientation of hydroxyl. If it's to the right, it's D. L is, yeah. Now, you are... On the right here, so... What's up? Well, here it's on the right. Yeah. Now, something... Okay, so glucose in the straight chain form is uh like 0.1%, like 0.1% of like glucose in our body 
is in this straight chain form? Because okay. most of it would be in what form? The like form that it usually wants to take. Which is? Circular. Yeah, like a ring, right? Yeah. So let's think about how it turns into a ring. Um. Doesn't it lose something from like the ends? So remember how I said like the hydrogen from here and the OH from a different one, like they so H2O comes off. So remember how hydroxyls are super are, are nucleophiles? Yeah. Um what's the most common electrophile that I talked about? You said it. It was um H. So, so another way of viewing it that could actually help you is, so what's the charge of an, of like an, an atom's nucleus? In the nucleus? Like you have the protons and the neutrons, so it should be either neutral or positive. Well, it'll have to have, I mean, it will have to have proton, like at least a one proton in it, right? Right. So it'll be positive. When you said Lewis base, that means that it's an um, electron donor and the Lewis acid is an electron acceptor. So doesn't that mean that it's like getting the H plus? Wait, wait. so um, the stuff with the H plus would be like the Bronson-Larry definitions of acids and bases. Right. But yeah, nucleophile would be a Lewis base, which would be electron pair donating. But I'm trying to like, describe it in a way that's more like salient, more easier for you to kind of remember. So it could also help to just think of a nucleophile as liking nuclei and nuclei are positively charged. So a nucleophile will attack something that's partial that's positively charged or partially positively charged, right? Nucleophile will attack partial positive. Yep, yep. Now what's so usually when I draw like the hydroxyl as the most common nucleophile, what do I usually draw as a most common electrophile now that you know that it's going to be something that will have a partial positive? Was it? What? I'm like trying to remember. I, I Was it water that you drew? So would, would okay, so... I'll show it to you again, but make sure you have this down, okay? So OH, let's say. Now, something with a carbonyl will be your most common electrophile. Because the carbonyl has a partial positive at the carbon, partial negative at the oxygen dipole going here, right? Mm hmm You see that? Yeah. Was it C O O H? Wait, wait, which hand? Like grasping at straws right now. I don't remember. Wait, oh what where's what are you saying about the C O uh I'm trying to remember what it was. Wait, carbonyl. Oh, carbonyl, it's just a carbon bound uh, it's a carbon that has a double bond to oxygen. Right? Right. So that could include aldehydes, it can include ketones, it can include carboxylic acids, it can include amides, it can include esters, it can include all that stuff, right? Okay. But but the carbonyl itself is just that carbon double bonded to oxygen, and oxygen is highly electronegative, so it pulls electron density towards itself away from the carbon making the carbon have this partial positive charge, which the nucleophile will attack and they okay. bond with it, right? Right? Yes. So knowing that, what type 
of reaction might occur in this glucose molecule? That's uh the question. What's that? Like the one in the question? Oh no. Just from the straight chain glucose that I made. What kind of reaction might occur? Yeah. So you have the C H, but it was with the C O. So I would here. Yeah. So there's a double bond. Yep. So that's going to be the electrophilic portion, right? Yeah. And then there's the OH here. Yeah. That's the nucleophile. Yeah. So it's going to be the fifth one. So this is going to attack here. Okay. Creating that new bond. And that would look like this where we have, I'll make it orange. So like the new bond that's created between this fifth hydroxyl and this first carbonyl carbon is going to be this bond in orange. Okay. Right? Now, yeah. um, now the, I guess I can draw like the, whatever, like the OH, 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 and then here's like the CH2OH. Now, this new bond here will, ha will have this, I'll mark it in pink, this oxygen will be either, let's say, here. This is the other kind of, this is the resonance one, right? Or uh, not resonance, but I remember like this was the one where you did the like the directionality of it. Yep, yep, yep. So, uh, yeah. So if this hydroxyl group is, sometimes people say like if it's up top, if it's below, but that's not necessarily the case because it could just be the entire molecule is flipped over. But mm -hmm. the best way to do it is that the alpha will have this first hydroxyl group um, on the opposite side of the last one. So the one that I just drew here is the beta anomer. And you can also have the uh, alpha. Yeah. And that would be in the opposite direction. Um, I'm not going to draw the rest of it just because I'm lazy, but uh, like 0.1% exists this way, like 34 maybe percent or whatever uh, exists. Yeah, I remember um, it's R versus S, right? When you say R versus S, you're talking about like the... Uh, like I thought that that was the, like when you organize the numbers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. So R is like with the right and S is left. Mm -hmm. Yep. So basically um, you're, you're so like six, like 34, whatever, 36% will exist as the alpha anomer, but 64% will exist as this beta anomer. Yeah. And okay. These can go back and forth in something called muta rotation. Okay. Now that's very different from resonance. People think resonance is going back and forth, but resonance is a superposition of the two. Whereas anomers, you know, going back and forth are, uh, is actually going back and forth. So it's called muta rotation. Okay. Okay. So definitely have to know this and definitely have to know how to like draw this glucose molecule because they expect you to know two epimers of glucose. So 
the epimers are the two things that come off, right? So epimers are just going to be like. No, those would be. Well, epi would be like the center, right? Like epi is something important. And then. So, yeah. So if you had like this, where we have. this um you could see that compared to glucose and i will use i'll use pink again so this one here is a c2 epimer of glucose because it's identical to glucose except for this second carbon position okay right and this is called mannose and what helps me is to think man with a gun two on that side two on this side right wait Okay. Yeah, it's like like if that's your hand. It's like the shape of a gun. Oh, okay. That mm -hmm. makes sense. Okay. Yep, that's the C2 epimer that you're expected to know. And there's the C4 epimer that you're expected to know, which would be like this and this is called galactose it's a c4 epimer of glucose so um and also galactose and glucose can form a disaccharide which is lactose mm -hmm. but but yeah okay so so an epimer Versus an enantiomer, right? Mm -hmm. Is what we're being asked here. Now, let's see. Okay, so they're giving us choices about whether it's an enantiomer or an epimer, and if the carbon atom is epimeric or anomeric, right? Mm -hmm. So what you could kind of analyze this in like the first thing and the second thing for each of the choices so uh that's how i would do it so either you can tell me if something's an epimer or an antimer or you can tell me if something is anomeric carbon or epimeric carbon what are your thoughts mm -hmm. So the I mm -hmm. just based off of what you were saying. Uh -huh. Just based off of what you were saying that the um epimers were, I think it makes more sense that. Just don't know if it would be anomeric or non anomeric. Oh, okay. So alpha and beta. So alpha, we said was. Yep. The alpha and beta should be the happening at the anomeric carbon, right? Right. And so then you're looking at the sides at which it happens. When you see the sides. Like, were you saying, like, the alpha orientation versus the beta orientation? So then, like, uh, like, if it was on one side, it would be one thing. But if it was on the other side, it would be a, a different 
Uh-huh. Like it would be non-anomeric versus anomeric, maybe. So so the anomeric will be the the result of the ring forming. Right? Right. So the ring with glucose forms when you took it out of the um yep. out of the Fisher projection, which means that those two have already left. So so we know epimers differ from one another by one chiral carbon, right? Right. What about enantiomers? I don't remember. So enantiomers will have... So remember when we talked about like SN2? Yeah. And that caused a, uh, an inversion of the stereochemistry? Right. So that has to do with enantiomers? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. That's not what's happening here, is it? So, so yeah. It's so causing a reversal of the... You just said that they could go back and forth between each other. It's not really a reversal because that sounds more permanent. So, so enantiomers will differ at every single chiral center. That's why it only has one. Yeah. Okay. So it is an epimer. Yep. Continue. What is an anomeric carbon atom? Does that have to do with like what you were saying with the carbon? Yep. This guy. This guy. Carbon nail carbon. Oh no no. It's it's the new bond that's created from when the fifth hydroxyl group uh, uh nucleophilically attacks that first aldehyde, mm -hmm. producing a new bond between yeah maybe I could even do like this um. So I made this one uh, uh pink. So this one is what that is, the, and then let me do one for all right. I'm gonna make this one green okay and that's this one okay so you see how the orange bond is newly created and since it's newly created it can have you know uh alpha or or beta positions for that okay. carbon makes sense kind of yeah i'm just okay so I don't know this last part just really confuses me like I understand that it's an epimer so it's between C and D and that like it's the so alpha and beta distinguish between but why would it be a non-anomeric carbon atom? Like the whole point is that it's at the like. Yep. So yes, that's going to be wrong because we. Yep. Because it's distinguishing between the anim, like the. Um. Yep. Okay. Yeah. That one was hard for me. So yeah, write somewhere down in your notes. Like again. Most common nucleophile, most common electrophile. Yeah. Structure of glucose. You can even take a screenshot. Structure of glucose and the structure or how it turns into a ring um, and the different types of anomers. And then also what mannose, the C2 epimer of glucose, looks like and uh, galactose, the C4 epimer of glucose. Okay. Huh? All right. Are we going until three? Yeah. Okay. Um. All right. Yeah. Do you mind erasing? I just sure. their explanation. Like I can screenshot this. Mm -hmm. All right. Osmotic pressure. I 
I'm thinking of like which one passes through like a membrane and would cause osmosis. Well, let's talk about what osmotic pressure is. Like the, pr I'm assuming that it has something to do with like how much like work it might take to like get it across a barrier. Okay, so do you remember colligative properties? I don't think so. So colligative properties are properties that you see in solutions rather than, you know, a pure substance. So, you know, for instance, when it's about to snow, they put... Salt? Yeah. Why do you think? Because it, like, um, breaks down the ice, like, when it freezes over. It does that, or maybe it does not need to break it apart because... Like, as soon as the, like, snow... It... So the, so the idea is, uh, in a solution is that the bonds of the solute will have strong bonds or affinities for the solvent. And if that's the case, let's say for water, if it's salt water, there will be stronger bonds between the water molecules and the salt molecules, which would make it more difficult for water to, let's say, freeze. So one of the collective properties is freezing point depression. Okay. So if they put snow out, I mean, snow, if they put salt out, it lowers the freezing point. So in order for snow, in order for ice to form, the temperature would need to be uh, lower. Okay. There's also boiling point elevation. Yeah. And, you know, you don't want to really think of these as completely, you know, disjointed things. You want to think about, you know, how the theory still makes sense. For instance, if you have stronger bonds between the solute and the solvent, boiling something, which involves breaking those intramolecular bonds, would be tougher because they're stronger between the solute and the solvent. So that's the second colligative property. Boiling the... point raised, freezing point lowered. Yep, yep. And then the third is uh, vapor pressure depression. And then the fourth is osmotic pressure. Okay. Osmotic pressure, think of it as like a sucking kind of pressure. Like, which is kind of weird because pressure we think of is like pushing against the walls of a container of some sort, but osmotic pressure is different from hydrostatic pressure and you learn that in the kidney right um where it's like a sucking type of pressure so there's also a formula associated with it i don't know if you remember with osmotic pressure i don't think so so okay let's see if we can do it without the formula so what would you do like what how would you logic this out? Which has the greatest osmotic pressure? Um, I would hmm. I would like start looking at the um the M is mass, right? Or a molarity. So okay. isn't it like grams to moles? or moles to grams, like you calculate. Here, I'll let you have the formula. OK. Where, where the pi uh, stands for osmotic pressure. All right, so we're calculating for pi. Yeah. Now. What's this little I? I don't know. Okay. 
So this little eye is called the Van Hoff factor. Mm -hmm. And what it means is, well, so, okay, let's say we have NaCl, like one mole. It would break apart into one mole of Na plus and one mole of fluoride, right? Okay. Uh huh. Now, so it produces these like two separate particles, right? So the I in this case will just be two. I is two, and that's what two ions, or just two. Uh -huh. yeah, it breaks apart into the two ions. Whereas if I had magnesium chloride. It would break apart into like one. If I have one magnesium chloride, it would be one mg two plus CL. Yep. What would be the Van Toff factor here? Three. Good. So there's three things, and then CaCl would also be three. Yep. And glucose would just be one. So there's only one ion. Point five, but yeah. What? Oh, sorry. Uh, so it's the the i would be one but then you bring up a good point because i think you have to multiply it by this factor yeah yeah and since a and c are the highest ones you multiply those two and then three versus um 0.6 mm -hmm. yep. how does it make it higher what was that Oh no. Okay, so then C is the answer. Good, good, good. My which event is directly mediated by lagging gated ion channel? I know that NAC, uh, NA and CA both pass through, but I'm assuming that one of them is like, I remember this. Okay. I think. Does the reticulum to initiate muscle contraction? Okay. I just can't remember which ones are ligand and which ones are voltage because CA2 is a calcium gated channel, right? Which one? Like the first one, A. Oh. That's a calcium channel. Because it's CA2. well the, now, whatever it's you know allowing the transport of um doesn't necessarily tell you what type of you know channel it is right but i'm just trying to think of it as far as like so talk to me about like a neuron and you know the depolarization etc b um i just don't think that sodium during action potential propagation, that means that it's like, yeah. like I remember something about neurons and voltage gated voltage gated channels like that. I remember there's some sort of correlation between. I don't remember the specifics of it, which is why I like I'm trying to remember the differences. Like ion gated is like when 
the ions pass through and it either it's open or closed. And then voltage is like a specific like set of conditions has to happen. Like something has to bind to something else in order for it to open. So remember this? Or no, that's for ion gated. Yeah, but that's like action potential. Yep. So so essentially the the resting membrane potential of a neuron is negative 70 millivolts and why is it like that? Why isn't it just zero? Because of a sodium potassium pump that uses energy to push out three sodiums and take in two potassiums, which gives it a net negative charge. Okay. And if there's some type, uh, let's say the threshold for um, action potential would be like negative 50 so if it's below that it won't do anything but if it reaches that it will that change in voltage will open up voltage gated sodium channels which would cause an influx of sodium influx of positive ion making the uh, causing this depolarization over here which makes it more positive less negative and at the peak here, the voltage-gated sodium channels close, but the potassium channels open, and it's potassium efflux leaving the uh, neuron mm -hmm. that we're going back to negative, but the potassium channel is slow, so it overshoots it, and we call that hyperpolarization. Right. Okay, right. But this is still a voltage gated channel, so it's not the answer that we're looking for. Right. But, uh, the second the C resulting in depolarization of so you said that action potential was voltage gated. Initiate muscle contraction. Yeah, now this is a little different here, right? Motor and plate, yes, because uh -huh. there's some kind of receptor that like opens it or like well, not like moves them across it. So this is like a bad drawing of a synapse between two neurons. Okay, yeah. But there's also something called the neuromuscular junction, which would, right. be, instead of a neuron to a neuron, it'll be a neuron to muscle. Yes. Okay. Now, from what we know, we know that the neuron to neuron does not involve ligand gated channels right so neuron to neuron they're not involved but neuron to muscle they might be all right okay um that makes c a good answer choice sure because okay so muscle to muscle is also probably the same principle as like the other one where it doesn't require it. And then muscle to muscle. So this is the only one that's going muscle to something else. Um, okay, this is a little... Um, okay, I, I understand how you went, went through that, I guess. But... Okay, yeah, yeah, that works. That works. <laughs> I was going to say that, yeah, that calcium can get released from the sarcoplasmic particulum, but yes, you're right. So, good job. <laughs> I'm like probably stressing you out too because I'm really not thinking of these things the way that you want uh, me to. You are, but... you are. I just realized that, yeah. That's, you know, all you need for it to be right. Um, 
you said it's like different from everything else and once you gave me like you explained to me that um wait so just just to make sure that I understand so voltage gated is for anything that's like from one interaction like from one type of muscle or to another or like one type of fiber to another but then the muscle to fiber made it a ion gated channel or I might have like fully messed up when you were explaining it to me No, um, I'm, I I was just looking for a good uh, oh here it is. Uh, picture of this. Oops. But is that correct? What I just said. Let me. You said again. Sorry. So, um, voltage gated was the muscle to muscle or like fiber to fiber. But once it was muscle to fiber, it was ion gated. Or is that wrong? You were saying once it was muscle to. What is that iron gated? Muscle to fiber, the way that it is in C. Oh, by fiber you mean the muscle? It says the yep. muscle fiber. Oh, oh, I see. Resulting in the depolarization of the muscle fiber main membrane. Yep, yep. Yeah, so I, I put a, an image in the chat where we have the neuromuscular junction. And uh, yeah, I mean erase my drawing so so yeah you could see that you know you have a neuron and then you have the motor uh end plate here and you know you have the ligand gated channels for the you know motor end plate um but i was just going to say that this calcium that gets released gets released from this thing called like uh well it gets released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum um but but yeah yeah that's basically it okay sounds good okay oh okay single point mutation results in a non-functional protein while in individuals heterozygous for this mutation were identified using a southern blot which pair of wild type mutant, mutant alleles were most likely contained in the mutation? This is the thing where it's like GC are harder to break than AT, right? Yeah. By the Which way, three. Another, by the way, I sent another image that's even better. But the what what the second image I sent has is the sarcoplasmic reticulum that releases that's where the calcium is is kept uh -huh. um uh -huh. and also we could see the, the the a bit of the you know cross bridge cycle as well this one right mm -hmm. okay these uh, the, the calcium's here and yeah okay cool all right let's go to that question that you're on so I'm going to assume that. Oh, okay. What, what What's a single point mutation? It's like only one of these gets mutated. All right. Um. Because there's, there's point mutations. There's like ones that are, um. because I'm thinking of like when the third base pair gets changed, sometimes it doesn't affect the structure because that's like a floppy, like it doesn't really matter as much. Well, but like. Oh, wobble? The wobbly. Yeah. So, um, yeah, continue with what you're saying. Um. Oh, oh yes, you're saying the third nucleotide in... Uh... Yeah, but, like, I'm just, like, when I remember reading about it sometimes, like, point mutation is, like, when it's only... I, I don't think that it was more than, um, more than just a singular. Like, it's not, like, a, um codon where it's like three amino acids sure 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 so yeah codon would have consist of three nucleotides and in the translation process the trna uh, the appropriate trna meaning a trna that is bound to an the appropriate amino acid um that trna has an anti-codon that will be complementary to the codon and that's how that amino acid will be added during translation. Okay. Um, now, point mutations are 
could could be pretty dangerous. Um, why do you think? Because it changes the entire like sequence. Yep, because it specifically alters the reading frame, right? It like yeah, I could shift it. Yeah, because and that would mess up everything afterwards, right? Yes. Now that would be if you had your single point mutation as an insertion or a deletion, right? Right. But if it's a substitution, it would maintain the reading frame, right? Yes. Good. Um, but or if it was, yeah, sorry. Single point mutation, but which contains the mutation? Um, like, <laughs> I still think that if I was looking at this problem, I would think about like base pairings, and I think that it would be more likely to like be one that has more of the T's. Oh, I see what you're, so that's what you're saying about the G. Yeah, where it's like those ones are easier to like break the bond between. So, okay, so that's that's something between, you know, the base pairs, hydrogen bonding to one another. Yes. But, but we're dealing with some type of single point mutation in a gene that creates this non-functional protein. And that individuals heterozygous for these this mutation were identified using a southern blot, which pair of wild type and mutant alleles most likely contain the mutation. So we have various wild type sequences. We have the corresponding mutant frequencies uh, sequences. So why don't we start by well, so any type of this blotting technique stuff would give you a type of insight into um so like the what the they check for yeah so like for instance so do you remember what the southern blot was checking for i think it was chart Charge? Oh, so, okay, so there's the mnemonic snowdrop. Yeah, that's what I was trying to remember. Um, so southern is DNA, northern is RNA, O is nothing, and then western is protein. But in all of these, you know, I guess techniques, you will have to use something like a restriction enzyme mm -hmm. and what what like tell me about that how does that how does that work the restriction enzyme yeah i mean it's probably keeping it to only test what it's supposed to test for or like well uh, so another word for it would be a restrict or uh an endonuclease yeah, I've heard restriction and grace before. What 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 would that do? Like I hate to like huh. say it so stupidly, but it like restricts the reaction. Well, not per se. Um so 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 remember how we talked about like okay, what does this do? What I wrote. Protease. Yeah. It's an enzyme that I think it stimulates. So you know it's an enzyme because it ends in ASE. Yes. What do you think the PROT means? Uh, Pro is like beginning. Um. Pro, like I'm thinking of protein. Protein. Yes. So maybe protein. So maybe a protease breaks a protein. But it wouldn't break it. Well, um, uh, what are you saying? Enzymes don't usually like break things, I feel like. Well, remember we talked about the various enzyme classes, a good deal of those involve breaking things, right? Right. You know, so enzymes could do a lot of things, right? But a protease is going to be something that breaks up a protein, 
right? You could have, what's a lipase? Breaks down a lipid. What's a glucosidase? Probably breaks the glucose. Yeah, or like a, you know, uh, carbohydrate. Uh, what's a nuclease? Breaks down a nucleus. A nucleus or? Nuclease DNA. Yeah, something like a nucleic acid, like DNA, RNA. Mm -hmm. Right? So, so, okay. When we do some type of blotting, what we do is we use restriction enzymes, aka endonucleases, aka breaking apart nucleotides within the middle because of the word endo, as opposed to the ends, which would be exo. Mm -hmm. So we break that up. And we want to break it up at palindromic sequences in order for us to create what's called sticky ends, which are and which have overhangs that can be reattached. So first, why don't we look for in these choices, which can be kind of annoying, what mutation happens compared to the wild type for each? Here. Okay. A to T. So that's just substitution. It won't really have any effect on structure. Continue. Um uh, here. So this one's more significant because it's C to G. Um C to G, again, same as here. It's not that significant. And then here, A to C. Okay. So let's say we didn't know anything about any of this stuff. What would be... I'm going to say that something like more like in the beginning would be more significant because like it reads five or it codes five prime to three prime. Okay. Because I was going to ask you without doing anything else, what, what would you choose? Um, yeah, I would probably choose D because it's like earlier on. So what we're looking for are endonucleases, right? Which would be not at the ends. Because what I was going to ask you before is which of these is the most different? Which of yeah, which choice is the most different? Well, I think that the ones that are changing like C to A or A to C are more different than the A to T or C to G because it's the same like base pairing. Well, uh, so, so okay, we see that uh, B and C have their mutation at the end. D has its mutation in the beginning. But A has it in the middle, and endonucleases do their stuff in the middle. But also think about if you did make that nick, you want to create overhangs. Therefore, you want to use palindromic sequences, right? I'm confused. So let's look at for A over here, right? Like A, A, G, C, T, T. Yes, okay. Right, and then we have, so if we were to, you know, make a nick here between the two AAs, Mm -hmm. It would be palindromic to this if that was to go in, from, you know, three to prime. I'm sorry, three to five prime. So that would be T, T, 
C, G, um, and then T, A. Wait, what am I talking about? T, yeah, T, A, I believe. So you could see how this is a palindromic sequence with the mutation in that palindromic sequence. So for instance, if we just made a nick like here, at, which would be on the other strand between the two Ts here, it creates this sticky end here and here. So what you essentially have is this and oops. Start TCG. You would get this as your sticky ends. But that's fine, right? Mm -hmm. Like they're all generally similar. Mm -hmm. So you have to do this every single time? Uh, well, well, in the sense of if you just looked at these choices and you remembered that we are trying to make these sticky ends, that means that there must be palindromic sequences that we use, right? And if the mutation, um, if there's that, that single point mutation, right? Then we're gonna look for where that mutation is located and if it's located within a palindromic sequence. Okay, so for the rest of them. Now, the rest of them are just at the ends here, which would not create that type of overhang. And we want the overhang? Yes, because that way we can combine it back together. We can kind of, yeah, put it back together. Okay. So, yeah. You can, um, I think there's like a good kind of drawing explanation for this. So if you select A, let's say, and let's do the drawing here. So, okay. So this is like the step-by-step -step here. So like five prime to three prime, A, G, T, A, C, T, let's say, right? So a DNA palindrome is when you flip it and it becomes identical to the complementary sequence. So this A, G, T, A, C, T, if you flip it to be three to five, it will be T, C, A, T, G, A. And that happens to be what's complementary to that original string. Okay, this makes more sense. Yep. So basically we were looking for the fact that it was in the middle and when we established, because I was too focused on like the significance of the mutation where it was just like. Yeah, I think you were looking for that type of like GC bonds being being stronger, but they would ask that in the context of like at what or which which base pair could be sustained at a higher temperature or something like that. Okay. But, right. but here we're looking for palindromic sequences. All right. Okay. So, okay. All right. So I need to review today. Do you want to meet again tomorrow? And then that'll just be like my last day. Uh, yeah, yeah we can do that. Um, Let me see. Because I can do any time tomorrow before like seven.
Um, okay, so I'm gonna uh have to like so I just sent an email to one of my students um that I'm going to ask if I can meet on Friday to fit you in, but let's Okay, I mean, if not, just let me know, but Yep, is yep. that okay to be posted? Uh Okay. yep, yep. Literally, like, any time tomorrow, it doesn't matter. Okay, got Okay, it. Yeah, all if, right. if that doesn't work, then we can maybe meet at 7. Uh, yeah. No, I, like, I can't do seven. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, so. That's in the, like, the blueprint class. <laughs> it's like seven to 9.30. It's really, Okay, like, so, yeah, I'll send you, um, yeah. I'll send you an email when, once I hear back from him. Okay, sounds good. Thank you so much. Yeah, All of right. course. All right. Take care. Did my parents send for um yesterday or not yet? Um, I sent my mom the text, but I just I don't know if she did it. Um, yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah. Sounds All right. good. All right. So text me about today's.